As we gather for Bioneer's 30th anniversary conference, we stand at the edge of prehistory. Nature is deregulating human affairs faster than a lobbyist can buy a politician. <laughs> Global weirding is upon us. We're in the end game of the dim ages, the collision between the state of nature and the nature of the state. Our civilization is a failed state. The big wheels are turning. We face a reckoning, transform or perish. It's emergence in an emergency. There's as much cause for hope as for horror. The good news is that we've done it before, and as Bioneers has shown for 30 years, in great measure, the solutions are present or we know what directions to head in. The solutions residing in nature consistently surpass our conception of what is even possible. We're entering the age of nature, and it's high time to learn the ground rules and play by them to design a regenerative and equitable civilization. The formula is simple. Taking care of nature means taking care of people, and taking care of people means taking care of nature. Regeneration is the byword. Resi building resilience is the grail, both ecological and social. The imperative is to fast forward the transition to 100% clean energy, keep the oil in the ground, and as Project Drawdown is showing, sequester carbon back where it belongs in a drawdown to 350 parts per million, which is doable with what we already have and know. Doing what's right for the climate means doing what's right for everything else. It's the reimagination of civilization in the age of nature. Yet the thing that we need most is what we have the least of, time. Slouching towards sustainability will not turn the tide. Only immediate, bold, and transformative action will enable us to make the leap across the abyss. That's what we're here to do. Looking back over these past three decades of pioneers, what's perhaps most salient to me is the extraordinary rise and influence of social movements and civil society. We've acted as the countervailing force holding back complete catastrophe while developing and modeling real solutions for very different ways of living on Earth and with each other. The Mayan people describe this movement of movements as one no and many yeses. The no is to the concentration of wealth and distribution of poverty. The yes is to a world where many worlds fit, a global society devoted to health, justice, dignity, diversity, and democracy, to human rights and the rights of nature. So I want to honor so many of you in this room who've been the visionary leaders of these movements, the tireless frontline activists, the organizers, the creators, the pathfinders, the healers, and the dreamers. As a community, we've shown that clean energy works. Ecological agriculture and carbon farming work. Biomimicry and indigenous traditional ecological knowledge work. Restorative justice works. Local economies, decentralized infrastructures, living buildings, permaculture, green chemistry, 3D ocean farming, they all work. And as Paul Stamets first showed us here in 1997, we know mushrooms really can save the world. <laughs> Meanwhile, communities are reclaiming democracy by revoking corporate rights. Nations are instituting legally enforceable rights for nature. Beloved community and gender reconciliation are alive and growing. Reparations are on the table. The forefront of leadership is coming from women, first peoples, communities of color, citizens, and now from the swells of amazing young people demanding that society wake the f up and start acting like grown-ups. Over these decades, we've seen these movements grow from the margins to the mainstream. Our job now is to bring them to scale. We first began advocating here at Bioneers for a Green New Deal in 1995. What may have seemed impossible is now suddenly within reach. The questions are what it's going to look like, how fast we can make it happen, and how we're going to overcome the retrograde forces pushing business as usual. And they do mean business. <laughs> 
One thing is for sure, the twin crises of climate chaos and extreme inequality will keep getting worse fast, and people will keep rising up in ever bigger numbers, demanding and making change. That's what happened in the 1930s, and it's happening again. As Tom Hayden pointed out here three years ago, at the time the New Deal was gestating, it wasn't called the New Deal. It was called the movement. It crystallized from a spray of initiatives that incubated in the laboratories of democracy, cities and states. In a few short years, the impossible became reality. Social security and pensions, bargaining rights for organized labor, unions, jobs by the millions doing meaningful work that needed to be done, and a cultural renaissance that changed the mindscape and the politics. Above all, the New Deal was about directing government away from serving the rich to serving the vast majority of people and the common good. As Kevin Baker recounts in his absolutely brilliant article, Where Our New World Begins, the Great Depression was an environmental collapse every bit as much as it was an economic collapse. By the 1930s, five-sixths of the original indigenous animal populations that thrived when the Europeans arrived had been extinguished. Seven-eighths of the original woodlands had been cleared. One-sixth of the topsoil in the U.S. would soon blow away in the cataclysm of the Dust Bowl. 35 million acres of previously arable land had been decimated, with another 225 million acres soon to follow. Plagues of locusts, rabbits, and green worms overran the land. The topsoil of Oklahoma and Wyoming blackened the skies of Chicago and New York. Like climate disruption today, millions fled as ecological refugees. As Baker points out, the devastation resulted from, quote, a desperate capitalist battle with every man for himself. If producing more crops drove down farm prices and wrecked the land, well, that was just how the market economy worked. The private sector offered no plan except more of the same. The populist party surged and the plutocracy attacked them as socialists. FDR stepped in with transformative government action guided by the remarkable understanding that the crisis had to be addressed as a whole system, the care of both people and nature. The new Soil Conservation Service launched over 500 soil project stations experimenting with farmers with novel practices such as terrace farming and contour farming. The government paid the farmers to participate and save their farms. The Civilian Conservation Corps employed three million men to plant thousands of acres of experimental drought-resistant grasses. They constructed more than 800 state parks and planted nearly three billion trees, including shelter belts, to secure the soil. In time, they restored more than half the damaged land. The programs also acknowledged nature's limits. They resettled farmers and refugees who became the unprecedented American middle class that emerged after World War II. And that was just a piece of the New Deal. There were massive public works programs, public health campaigns, prenatal and birth care for women, libraries, public arts. Although the New Deal made bad mistakes and odious compromises, it got a lot right. It had been a close call. The nation could just as easily have plunged to the right. And plunging to the right is exactly what the plutocrats have been doing ever since to roll back the New Deal to get back to a government serving the rich. The great work today of the Green New Deal is to avert climate chaos, build resilience to adapt, and lift the burdens of history once and for all. We need to overturn the New Deal's grievous old deal with the Southern Dixiecrats to keep the racial caste system in place. And we need to build an inclusive society of jobs with justice and community self-determination. And ultimately, in the 1930s, big business co-opted the economics to assure its ongoing hegemony. It was only World War II that actually pulled the country out of the Depression. Today, the world war is to save human civilization as we know it, to save it from ourselves. In the 30s, it boiled down to saving capitalism from itself. But this time around, capitalism may not be salvageable at all. Beginning in the... Beginning in the 1990s, corporate globalization triggered a tectonic shift of wealth and political power upward to a super elite of billionaires. 
they launched a full frontal corporate takeover of government. According to Jeffrey Winters, the author of Oligarchy, wealth in the US is over two times as concentrated as Imperial Rome, which was a slave and farmer society. If billionaires were a nation, they'd be the world's third largest country. Call it bottom down and top up, breadcrumbs and circuses. As Fortune Magazine CEO Alan Murray recently commented, more and more CEOs worry that public support for the system in which they've operated is in danger of disappearing. Hmm. <laughs> As Farhad Maju wrote in the New York Times, they're worried that when the next recession breaks, revolution might too. The coming recession might finally prompt the masses to sharpen their pitchforks and demand a reckoning. But the, C <laughs> but the CEOs now have a plan to head off a revolution. They want you to know, actually, they really do care about the world. Like, a lot. If I sound, if I sound cynical, it's only because I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> and he concludes, it's, it's all a game to the moguls in charge. Their greatest fear is that we'll stop playing. So much for the, quote, end of history that political scientist Francis Fukuyama pronounced in 1992 after the fall of the Soviet Union. Capitalism seemed triumphant, unopposed, unassailable. Author Mark Fisher calls it capitalist realism. It's easier for most people to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Three decades later, it's boom and doom the terminal convulsions of an oligarchic economic system bedeviled by $100 trillion of stranded oil assets and the impossibility of unlimited material growth on a finite planet. Petrostates and fossil fuel corporations are growing desperate. The frenzy of deregulation is the distress signal of a failing business model. Market trauma is in store. Trump is just the hood ornament on the Hummer of Plutocracy gone off-road. I hope there's some graphic artists out there. <laughs> Monopolies smother the economy. The roster of Fortune 500 companies leads, reads like a rap sheet of mass crimes. It's gangsters and warlords making feudalism great again. Me meanwhile, what Oliver Bulla calls money land has emerged as the dark twin of, of globalization. As much as $36 trillion is stashed in offshore black holes. $1 trillion every year exits the world's developing countries in laundered money and tax avoidance. By 2015, 52% of Russian wealth resided outside the country. Untraceable shell companies are behind the majority of investment linked to Amazon deforestation, illegal fishing, and other crimes against nature and humanity. And most of Moneyland, of course, is entirely legal. It's the system that's the crime. As writer Franklin Four commented, Thievery tramples the possibilities of workable markets and credible democracy. It fuels suspicions that the whole idea of liberal capitalism is a hypocritical sham. The predicament is double-barreled. Failing to imagine the end of capitalism may mean the end of the world. On the other hand, state socialism has equally failed. The ground truth is that there's no precedent or grand model for a next economy, one that's grounded in equity, and the limits and principles of nature. The first question is, what's the economy for? If building resilience is the goal, the priority shifts from growth and expansion to sufficiency and sustainable prosperity. Real wealth creation is based on replenishing natural systems and restoring the built environment, especially our infrastructure and cities. It's based on investing in our communities and workforce, and it works best when it's done all at once. Economic relocalization creates three times as many jobs, earnings, and tax collections, as well as far greater stability and security. 
Like the New Deal era, today waves of smaller scale models and policies are percolating from the bottom up. Gar Alperowitz and the Democracy Collaborative call it the pluralist commonwealth. A core principle is to shift ownership of the nation's wealth institutionally to benefit the vast majority. Ownership becomes diversified, public, private, cooperative, and worker-owned enterprises. Too big to fail giants are simply broken up or restructured as public utilities. Nor is there, thank you. <laughs> Nor is there a model for what true democratic governance looks like at modern scales. We need to reclaim democracy and decentralize political and economic power to local and bioregional levels. It begins and ends with community and with building stable transgenerational wealth, community wealth and job creation. But paradigms die hard and empires die harder. As Charles Blow wrote, this is a game of power, pure and simple, and it's about whether the people who've long held power will be able to retain it. The founders, and I continue the quote, the founders, a bunch of rich, powerful white men, did not want to true democracy in this country, and in fact, they were terribly afraid of it. Now, a bunch of rich, powerful white men want to return us to that sensibility. Naomi Klein warns us against climate barbarism, and she says this, this is how the wealthy world is going to, quote, adapt to more climate disruption, by fully unleashing toxic ideologies that rank the relative value of human lives in order to justify the monstrous discarding of huge swaths of humanity. It's the last ditch play by billionaire nation to make heaven a gated community, even if it's hell on earth. Instead, what's rising up is the return of the repressed. Everyone who's been othered, marginalized, and deleted. The poor, working people, women, people of color, indigenous peoples, immigrants, LGBTQ people, young people. The last shall be first after all. The word crisis comes from the Greek word krino. It means to decide. We need to decide what kind of future we want and act like our lives depended on it. It's now a clock. And I'd like to close with a story. Um, the Mayan people call this the time of no time. Oki Simini Forrest, a Canadian wisdom keeper of Mohawk descent who lives and works in Chiapas with the Mayan people, describes the Mayan vision in this way. From here on, we're on earth time. Mother Earth is shaking to her core. It's a time of madness, disconnection, and hyper-individualism. It's also a time when new energies are coming into the world when people are growing a new skin. The Mayan vision says that we in the West will find safe harbor only if we can journey past a wall of mirrors. The mirrors will surely drive us mad unless we have a strong heart. Some mirrors delude us with an infinity of reflections of our vanity and shadows. Others paralyze us with our terror and rage, feeding an empire that manufactures our fear into resignation. But the empire has no roots, and it's toppling all around us. And this time, everyone is called to take a stand. Everyone is called to be a leader. To get beyond the wall of mirrors, the final challenge is to pass through a tiny door. To do this, we must make ourselves very, very small, to be very humble. Then we must burrow down into the earth where indigenous consciousness lives. On the other side is a clear pond. There, for the first time, we'll be able to see our true reflection. In this time of no time, they say, we can go in any direction we want by dreaming it. Our dreaming can shift the course of the world. It's going to be a long and winding trek across generations. We're already making some of the pathways others can walk toward our many dreams. Countless more dreamers will blaze luminous new trails. The dreams are already within us. One day, may we awaken to find ourselves living in our wildest dreams. Thank you.